Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of the world's biggest stars and some of my favourite people. And we've found a comedian who is simply brilliant. She's multi-talented, she's gorgeous. And I wouldn't mind marrying Vicky Stone. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. You're fit, you're talented, you're funny, you're really every man's dream. Well, you, you say that. Uh, <laughs> I think um, it's, I'm sort of one of those people that scrubs up all right, you know? You I, should see me in the morning. Hmm. Well, and especially when I see you in character, you know, when, you, when you're stood there putting all the slap on and all of that, I think that that adds an extra edge, doesn't it? It does. It does. It does add an extra edge. I'm a big fan of... Uh, I'm a big fan of going onto a stage at a comedy club and a stripper heel. There ain't many people that do that. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking more Hilary DeVay, it does it for me. Oh, right, yeah, my impression of Hilary DeVay. Uh, yeah, um, that, was, uh, that, was, that was good fun. I like Hilary, she's still on. Listen, let's start at the beginning. Firstly, you're okay. so talented. Um, I love the fact that you play the piano and you do it brilliantly. I also love the fact that although you're singing nonsense songs, you've got a terrific voice, a great gift. Congratulations on that. Thanks, good. Or myself. I think there are a lot of people trying, it, you know, but the, the, the avenues in which to um, to sort of show that off now is, is very much sort of X Factor and things. And I think the public are a bit apathetic now yeah. about a bit of warbling. Have you thought of doing something like Britain's Got Talent? I mean, it makes people, but it also breaks them. Is that too risky for you at this stage? Well, I mean, I've been approached by Britain's Got Talent for years and they, I think most people that do what I do have been approached. You know, they, they have to scout the talent. And it's just not something I would do at the moment because at the end of the day, you'll end up losing to a dog. And that's the, uh, that's the reality. <laughs> I'm good, but I'm not a dancing dog. And that's that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> It is interesting show business now, isn't it? I mean, there are people like you who are so skilled at what you do touring the country, but it is hard work. I was looking at your website and the list of dates. I mean, you're literally in Birmingham one day, Bournemouth the next, Edinburgh the next, Leeds the next, Nottingham the next. I mean, you're all over everywhere. Is that exhausting or do you embrace it? It's both. I mean, it's exhausting. Um, uh, if you're in a touring musical or something, you get a week in each place. But when you're touring, at my level, you have to do one night in each place and getting the whole equipment up and down and then getting on the road again day on day. It's really hard, um, but it's obviously really, really worth it because that's how you kind of build an audience and, and get out there and uh, perform to people and sort of, you know, have a fun day. I'm trying to work out whether you're a genius or really stupid because most comedians turn up in a pair of jeans and just go on and talk and then leave. You've got all the slap and all the gear to go with you. Um, it does add an extra pressure, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I every year, so last year I had a really big kind of touring set with me and I vowed that next year I'm just going to do stand-up, I'm not going to take a piano, I'm just going to, I want it to be easy, I want to just be able to turn up and do a show and this year it's even bigger and I just think that I'm never going to change. I really like, I like a big show, I'm a bit old school, I like production values, you know, I sort of, I, I sort of, I feel like I'm a bit of, sort of Lady Gaga of comedy, you know, <laughs> the, the, more, the, the more successful I get, the steps are just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and it's just going to get more and more extreme. I would think that's the bonus of doing what you do. The more money you make, the more you can put into the show, the more rewarding it is. I mean, especially with an act like yours, that's yeah. sort of the affirmation that you're doing well, isn't it? Yeah, and also the great thing about it with comedy is that no one's, no one's saying no. Like, last year, I had this idea for a gag where I would nip off stage for a couple of seconds and then come back on riding a, an almost life-size camel. <laughs> and I just, I emailed yeah. this idea to my agent. I went, yeah, I want this camel. And she priced up the camel. And I went, yeah, let's do it. Let's, uh, she was like, you sure? I was like, yes, absolutely. Let's, let's buy the camel. Let's buy the sit on camel. Let's have wheels put on it. And let's do it. And so for a 30-second gag, I've now got a ride on camel in the garage now here's the thing 20 years I've been interviewing people and I thought I'd asked every question going but here's a question I've never asked before how much okay. does a, a camel cost on wheels well the camel itself was 500 pounds <laughs> and then the and then to get the I know please and then to get the wheels put on was about another 80 quid so, fabulous um, 600 pound camel yeah. marvellous we should all have one yeah <laughs> well, that, the worst thing is, is that it's now in the garage, and I sort of kept it, and I was like, because it was my, it's the last year's show, and so I've kept it, and I thought, well, maybe I could have it in the house somewhere, but I've tried it in various places, and it just looks like a camel on wheels in the lounge. You're going to be like Joe Pasquale one day, aren't you? Get invited to the Royal Variety and end up on a real camel. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm the sort of person that I will say yes to everything. Like, I, I once got asked, Vicky, will you wear a meat dress and a petting suit? Yeah. Yeah, I will, yeah. And then, and then you wonder what, you know, if you wonder why a donkey, like, 
trying to reach at a piece of fillet steak that's going to touch your bone with gaffer tape. You know, it's, uh, yeah, I, I sort of learned the hard way. I sometimes wish I was a donkey. Only sometimes, Vicky, but... Uh... <laughs> Is that one of the times? Yeah, just, just some of the time. Um, I, I know a lot of people say of you that you're like Victoria Wood, and I hate doing that because it's comparing you to somebody else and that's never fair in the business, but I know what they mean. The last person who was successful with the piano, I suppose, was Tim Minchin and Victoria Wood, and you do it as well as them. Coming up with these cockamimi ideas, you sit and write a funny tune. Probably your most successful is Philip Schofield. You're a little bit infatuated with him for a time, weren't you? Yes, I was, yes. I, I mean, obviously I get compared to Victoria Wood because there isn't anyone else doing it. And, and she was, um, interestingly, the history of women doing funny songs uh, came from musical. So like a hundred years ago, yeah. in a variety show, women were funny and singing. That was their job in a kind of comedy show. It was a bit like, you know, it was all innuendo, um, innuendo-filled songs. And yeah. then women during wartime were, weren't were funny anymore. So the women singers were kind of sent out to sort of, you know, G up the troops and G up the country. And, it, and they weren't meant to be funny. It was all meant to be dead serious. And no one did funny songs then until Victoria Wood in the in the 70s. And so, you know, there, there isn't like anybody else kind of building up the form. And so obviously I'm going to get compared to that because there haven't been many people that have done it. Yeah. Females. I get a bit offended by the BBC on many levels, but one of the things that really pisses me off is when they say stick on a woman because we've got to tick a box. It's a great insult to people like you and Catherine Ryan, young, great mm. female comics who are as good as any guy. I, I'm sure you agree. You don't need an open door. You'll do it yourself. Absolutely. I mean, some of the best comics in the country, let alone female comics, some of the best comics in the country are women. The likes of Bridget Christie, Sarah Pascoe, people that are really talking about important topics. And it, it, you know, never mind great news, the best comedians at the moment are women. Yeah. Um, and it's because you've got you've got to be so much better. You've got you've got to be as good as a man and then some to get on to get on one of these programs. Yeah. Because I mean, you know, I, I've done lots of kind of. Um, you get to practice these things. They're called run throughs, where they're like, it's like an audition for a panel show. And so I, I've done lots and lots of these, and they are. They're really very difficult because men just talk over you. They just won't let you speak. Wow. And it's so hard. It's so hard to kind of get, get your point across and get a good gag in. And, and so you have to, you, you know, your, your skin gets thicker and thicker because it's just harder. It's interesting. I interviewed yeah. Dara O'Brien once about Mock the Week, which I think is the worst for that over-talking. It's the most competitive mm -hmm. of all those type of shows. And he said Frankie Boyle would often do a 20-minute rant about this or the other thing. And he'd sit there thinking, you're wasting your breath. It's never going to get in the programme. A, because I can't put it in no. if, if I wanted to. And B, it's too long. It's interesting, as you say, how the guys go on there with sort of an agenda, isn't it? I think that um, the problem with shows like Mock the Week is that they turn comedy into a competition. Mm. And when I'm on stage doing my show, it's not a contest. Right. You, you know what you're seeing, you've paid to see me, and you sit there and you watch me, and I can, I can talk at a relaxed pace, I can talk about topics that I like, I don't have to be competitive, I don't have to be kind of forceful and aggressive, and it's just these television shows make you, make you, and they make women look like a bitch. If you're fighting to be heard on a show like that, mm. they make you look really kind of bossy, and they don't suit the personalities that are more kind of silly and daft, which right. is where I sit. You know, I'm, I'm very much, I want to kind of take my time and, and sort of build up gags yeah. and silliness and, and sort of, you know, things like that. And the current TV formats don't really suit that kind of, that kind of comedy. Yeah. What goes around comes around, though. I mean, I think you are of the time. The great thing about what you do is it doesn't look old-fashioned. Is that about the topics you talk about? Is it to do with the way you deliver them or the writing in the beginning? I think it's a bit of both. I think that, um, you know, everybody has... Uh, I, I tour with a big white grand piano because I think that people have a better... Um, when, you, when they sort of look at that, they know what they're watching. Whereas yeah. if I play from behind, like, a keyboard or something perhaps looks more contemporary and more kind of like pop music mm. so I like to sit behind a grand piano because that really kind of sets sets off the um, the sort of cultural references yeah. but I think that um, there's a certain generation that feel very comfortable watching me the, uh, uh, people of my my mum's age which uh, sort of the people in their sort of mid to late 50s that Victoria Woods was around when they were kind of growing up um, and they love it because they can just relax right in and they know what it is and, and young people are almost kind of mind blown by it because I don't really, you know, Victoria Wood isn't really on the telly anymore. She's not doing comedy songs. You know, she you have yeah. to sort of dig out her stuff on YouTube to find yeah. out to find her to find stuff like you know, let's do it and her kind of big big hit songs. Yeah. 
so yeah I think it's um, you know I think it's uh, it, it, it's cool and to be able to um, take up contemporary topics like celebrities and things like that I mean the way that Philip Schofield and Brian Cox and the people that I've written songs about and sketches about have responded to them has been brilliant you know I mean the Philip Schofield song in itself to, to have written a song and then um, and then have him be in it and then actually perform it live on this morning yeah. I, I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't have, I couldn't have taken a comedy song any further. It's like something that I've written and it, it couldn't have got any bigger. No. Absolutely. And the way you did it was faultless. I wonder what confidence it takes to sit there opposite the guy you're flirting with in a song and do it eye to eye within punching distance. That's got to be slightly unnerving. Well, it was <laughs> funny. I mean, I, I had to get there and have to sound check. And obviously, Philip wasn't there in the sound check. They put two, um, they put two producers in Philip's chair where Holly was. And they're like, he'll be there. And I was like, yeah, great. You know, I'm quite a showbiz. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Great. Technical, technical. Brilliant. And then... Um, and then there was about 10 seconds before it went live and he actually just nipped in the chair like about 10 seconds before yeah. and that was it I, had, I didn't get any any opportunity so I didn't actually meet and say hi yeah. until we were on air and so I've never met him before and so it was the strangest thing I didn't have time to be nervous I was just like right this is my job I, this is now going live to I think about a million and a half people so let's just get on with it Let's face it, though. I mean, there can't be any greater compliment than somebody as fit as you, as young as you, as popular as you, writing a song about somebody like him. I mean, he's got to be a compliment, hasn't it? Yeah, and I also think that, um, you know, I think whenever I do that song live as well, I always get people going, yeah, dang. You know, he's a, I don't like to use the word weird crush, because it's not weird, but it's just, it's just funny, isn't it? <laughs> but, you know, you, you, you sort of... You know, lots, lots of people feel the same. There's a reason why that show does so well. Yeah, I'm a ginger person. I don't think I'm in a position to mock the grey haired, do you? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> what are you most I mean I was looking at your CV and you're an incredibly talented musician what are you best at singing playing the piano or comedian comedian I like that verb um, <laughs> my the, the, the thing that I strive to do is that I always try to write music for comedy songs that stands, stands alone as music itself yeah. so if, the, if, if you if you took the tune away from the songs that I write that, you could write it it could be a, a, a proper song that's what I try to do. Yeah. Um, so in the Philip Schofield song, uh, it's got um, five key changes, and the keys change every time the gag gets, every time there's a joke in the middle. So, you know, and that's subtle, and, that, and you know, the only really, really in tune musicians will right. realise the amount of key changes there are and stuff like that. So I just try and make it as technically as technically satisfying for myself as possible. Um, I, I, I had a, a strangely negative review um, that said, I don't know why she's doing comedy because the, the music is brilliant. It could be a film score. Mm. And it's like, that's why I'm doing comedy. Yeah. Because I, t I can bring both to the table. You know, it's, it's, it's odd to say, um, I, I, you know, I've had, it, I've had it a number of times where it says I'm wasting my talent. It's like, I'm absolutely not. I'm, 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 I'm bringing together two art forms. It's a nice backhanded compliment, though, isn't it? That I mean, basically what they're saying is your standard is good enough to stand alone, and if you wanted to sing, I don't know, Carpenter's Numbers, you could do it and people would listen. I, I know what they mean. You're not playing at playing the piano. You, you actually do it brilliantly. Exactly. But, I, but I, I think that that is what makes great musical comedy. Yeah. You've got to have good music. Um it's interesting you talk about that key change stuff. I remember in Barry and Frieda when Victoria Wood did it, it goes up and bigger and faster yes. and crescendos and goes up and up and up. Is there something about comic timing and that with music? Is there a synergy there in the sort of key change, the speed and all of that stuff? Absolutely. I mean, that, and, and that's what I mean about good musical comedy is that, so I, in the middle of my Philip Schofield song, I have like one fairly kind of one line or two line of gags yeah. that keep going. Um, and... And, and, and that's it and, and if I didn't change the keys there wouldn't be a sense of the gags getting sillier and sillier yeah, and sillier right. bigger and bigger to that big punchline um, and, and that's and that's how you know that's how you kind of have to do it because people get into a rhythm with listening to musical comedy because they think that the, the punchline's always going to come on the rhyme at the end of a verse or at the end of a chorus yeah. and you can you can break that by using tempo and key change and kind of crescendo and that kind of stuff to kind of to, to break the rhythm and surprise the audience. Second geeky question then, how do you get the yeah. gags in without over singing them with the next line? Because you can't just fill, can you, when it's a written piece of music? No, um, it can be tricky as well. You, you've got to, um, with, with the singing, I have to make sure that sometimes I don't over sing something. Right. I could sing something too well and then people don't listen to the lyrics. So you have 
have to kind of sing something. So I never get things like big reverb put on the on my. Um, this is a technical thing. But you know, when you yep. watch X Factor and stuff, there's that big sort of ethereal sound, lots of reverb, lots of effect. And I can't do that because uh, because I've, you've got to listen to the lyric. The lyric is the most important thing. Yep. And if they don't listen to the lyric, and then you've got to make the mu- you know you don't want the the singing to sort of overpower what's going on too much because they ultimately they have to listen. And then third geeky question, what are you thinking about yeah. when you're in the middle of one of these big songs? Because you've got to play the piano, you've got to sing, you've got to remember your lines, you've got to look interesting, you've got to remember the next bit of the show, you've got to worry about doing the shopping on your way home. Where are you mentally during these songs? Well, the, uh, it depends how new or old the songs are. If the song is, like the Philip Schofield song, I don't have to think about uh, the music at all. Um, the hands just go on autopilot. Right. So um, there, there's a comedy show called Comedy in the Dark, mm. where you do the whole gig in the dark. And as long as I've got my hands in the place for the first note, I can play all my songs that I know really, really well without looking at all. Wow. So, so yeah, it's just a matter no, I, I, you know, I can sort of, and that's that's also a part of being a good musical comedian as well as that you've got to really maintain eye contact with the audience. You don't want to have to look at your hands too much. Yeah, it's a good moral for your private life as well in the bedroom, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. If you don't have to look at your hands, you know you're onto a good thing. Um, <laughs> Vicky, it's always nice to, to find somebody new and refreshing and different and brilliant, and you tick all of those boxes. Um, for you, is this the dream to be out there just doing it? I mean, are you happy with that, to just see audiences? Because I, I was at a gig the other day, and I think 25 people turned up. 20 of us had got free tickets. It's a tough game to fill theatres, and you seem to be doing it, which is an amazing achievement. Yes, I mean, it's very difficult to uh, to fill theatres, um, and it will change to what part of the country you're in and that kind of stuff, um, and, you know, towards, to do with the uh, sort of demographics of, where people live and or whether lots of people use the internet or Twitter sort of around those places um, but yeah I mean it's, it's great and it's just really nice now to have things like to, to be able to connect with people that have just seen you and my new show is sort of dealing with some slightly heavier topics than normal and um, and people have sort of come up to, sort of t- tweeted or come up to me after the show saying oh I've sort of been through the same thing and thanks for talking about it and making us laugh about it um, which I think is really really important so I really like you know the, the connection and to be able to sort of perform to, to real people that you know are there <laughs> do you have any rules about how far you can go or what you can talk about no I think that um, as long as you can back it up as long as you've got really good reason I, I think there's no such thing as an off limit subject really um, you know if, if, if you've got I'm not saying you just want to do gratuitous gags that just offend people that's not my style and that's not what I do um but, you know, I, I, I think it's perfectly possible to deal with some, some pretty heavy topics with comedy. I think that comedy does raise awareness and makes people kind of think, especially if they're laughing about something. If you can, if you can get the holy grail of laughing and making people maybe think about uh, you know, bigger questions and that kind of stuff. I think you're onto a bit of a winner. Yeah, it's kind of leaving them a gift to go home with to think about, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think so, and, and I like to get that mix of just at, you know, sort of get out of your get out of your own life irreverent. But then I also like to bring it round to, to something that's a bit more um, bit more important, which yeah. uh, I always kind of strive to do. Listen, congratulations. What a stunning act. Vicky Stone is on the road. She's coming oh, to uh, Cranley Arts Centre on the 18th of September. Hull, uh, 19th, 24th at Salford, Nottingham, 25th. You can find all the dates at www.vickystone.com. A rare and brilliant act. Congratulations. I look forward to seeing you very soon. Thanks for talking to me. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.